down and coming out up here where it goes on up the tower. Now this coil is connected to the tower base right here and connected to the radial plate down here. You may be able to see the connection where the coil is uh, tied onto the radial plate. The ground radials come in and are tied around the edge of the radial plate, which is the correct way to uh, terminate a ground radial system. It gives the minimum inductance uh, to the uh, <coughs> ground system. Now, here is a feature that is an absolute must in base insulating a tower. The connection of the tower to the insulator must be flexible. Ceramics are very strong in compression, but they are weak in tension, so that you must not put bending moments on a base insulator. Hazen has made a ball and socket joint right here using a trailer hitch bowl that is fastened to the top of the insulator. And then on the underside of the tower base section, he's got a block of metal right here in which he machined a, a cone-shaped hole that fits over that ball so that the tower, which may sway in the wind, as any tower will, does not put any bending moment on the base insulator. All forces on the base insulator are thereby directly vertical, and the insulator is safe from breakage that way. <coughs> this coil is um, <coughs> part of the tuning network for his 160 meter operation, that he, where he uses the whole tower as a vertical antenna. It makes a, an excellent vertical antenna, and if you look at uh, some of the QSL cards he's gotten for, from DX contacts on the 160 meter band, you can appreciate the, uh, <clears throat> the great transmitting capability of such a vertical antenna as that. This white thing is um, a plastic pipe conduit that carries all of his uh, coaxes and rotor cable back on the ground, back to the station. <clears throat> Here is a thing that is very essential on any base insulated tower, and this is the picture of the spark discharge gap at the uh, KC5DX tower base. This he fabricated out of some large acorn nuts of stainless steel with uh, screws for adjustment. <coughs> it's tied on to the top of the insulator right here, which of course is tied to the tower. And this is a, a fairly large diameter uh, metal column that goes down and is bolted onto the radial plate. The gap is set at about 3 16 of an inch, uh, which will uh, arc over within about uh, 500 nanoseconds uh, at some 15,000 volts. After a discharge occurs, even with a very heavy lightning bolt as, uh, uh, for instance, 50,000 amperes, still only a few hundred volts of uh, uh, voltage drop across the gap will exist. That means that the matching network at the base of the tower will only be uh, exposed to some maximum of 15 kilovolts for a very, very small fraction of a second. Uh, the tuning capacitor he has in there is uh, is a 15 kilovolt capacitor, so it's completely safe even with direct lightning strokes on the tower, which he does occasionally get. <coughs> this is, allows the uh, uh, lightning current to pass directly on into the radio ground system where it's uh, safely dissipated in the earth and does not tend to follow the coax back into the shack, which is not a good idea to have that happen. Any time that uh, you fellows get the idea of base insulating uh, a tower or a mast of any kind, be sure to provide a lightning gap across it. This otherwise can be a very dangerous thing. <clears throat> Here also at KC5VX is the four tower directional array for the 80 meter band. These towers are 60 feet high 
and the uh, array is switchable to four different directions. He finds that very effective. <coughs> this is one of the towers. You can see it's guide at the 40-foot level, leaving the top 20 feet uh, self-supporting. <coughs> that is a picture of the base of one of those towers in the 80-meter array. You can see the ground radials, which he has just laid on the ground. He has not buried those. They are attached around the periphery of a radial plate. Again, the, the correct technique for terminating a radial system. <coughs> Uh, this is a picture of the uh, tower at N5SU, my own station. Uh, it is uh, 50 feet high, guided at the 30-foot level. <coughs> and you see a, a ring up there at the top for a reason that I'll explain to you. Of course, I did not intend this to be an electrical talk, but uh, rather mechanical. However, I'll uh, show you a picture of that ring. It's a corona ring, and the purpose of it is as follows. Above the surface of the Earth, there is a natural, normal potential gradient, static potential gradient of about 300 volts per meter. When clouds come over, that may rise to 1,000 volts per meter. In stormy conditions, it can, that potential gradient can go as high as 5,000 volts per meter. This tower is a little over 16 meters in height. <coughs> So with uh, even the 1,000 volt per meter static gradient, the top of the tower can be as much as uh, 16,000 or more volts different in potential from the air around it. Therefore, uh, dust particles that are in the air can be strongly attracted to the top of the tower. Uh, if there are any sharp edges up there, a slight uh, slight corona discharge will take place, which doesn't hurt it as a transmitting tower in the least, but it plays hard with your receiver. It makes it very noisy. And how many times have you heard fellows say, well, I tried a vertical antenna one time, but it was so noisy on receiving, I could not use it. Uh, largely, this is the reason for that. They <coughs> let, uh, let a vertical antenna have some sharp points, and that uh, little bit of invisible corona that takes place uh, really pairs up the uh, receiving capabilities. I learned this long, long ago, so when I built up this uh, tower system, I put about 18 inch diameter ring on the top of it that gives uh, uh, gradient distribution around it to eliminate that kind of um, corona noise, and so it makes an excellent receiving antenna as well as transmitting. <coughs> now here is uh, the way I have attached the guy insulators to the uh, tower itself, I fabricated some aluminum uh, parts to fit around the uh, tower legs there. It's an aluminum tower, and so I used aluminum connections to it rather than steel, so that uh, wear would not be on the tower particularly, even from any vibration or motion. <coughs> These insulators I use are six feet long. They're fiberglass insulators. Again, they are a type which is used by the power company for insulating down guys uh, where it's necessary on the uh, power poles. Uh, made by A.B. Chance Company in Missouri. They are rated at uh, 10,000 pound working load, which I certainly don't have on this. I have a maximum of about 800 pounds uh, tension on, on that uh, tower in the high wind. This is at the base of the tower where I have the matching networks uh, for the uh, multi-band operation. I operate this on every band from the 160 meters up to the 10 meter band. The uh, antenna switch is seen on this side whereby the, uh, the tower is switched to uh, any one of several networks. And on the other side, the, the transmission line switches the ceiling in another view. <coughs> Now here is a, a feature I wanted to point out to you. Again, I have the uh, tower base uh, sitting here on a spherical surface. You'll see this rocker plate under here, right at this point. There's a uh, curved surface, and then this uh, large pin, a one-inch diameter pin, projects up loosely through a hole 
in the bottom of the base plate of the tower so that the tower can rock on this, but it's uh, held captive. It cannot escape because of that pin through there. You might say, gosh, take that tower jump off of there. Well, you just try and lift that sucker off of that pin. It's <laughs> it just won't work. <clears throat> you first of all come up against the uh, drawing up the tension on the guys, and it will take uh, a lot of big fellows to lift that thing off. You'd have to loosen the guys, actually. <clears throat> Here's the lightning discharge gap. I used some uh, stainless steel uh, spheres on there. Uh, this is a corona shield right, that I put in there around the top of the insulator, again, to distribute the gradient <coughs> to lower any possible losses in that. In my tower, since it's only 50 feet high, operation on the 160 meter band demands some rather high voltages to be uh, across the tower base, actually about 5,000 volts peak. <coughs> this view I have taken to show how the ground radials are brought up out of the ground and fastened on the underside of the radial plate. You see I have it drilled and tapped all the way uh, around there to accommodate 32 radials. These are nine gauge bare wire. Right at this point you see a little, a little red line there. It doesn't show very well, but it's an insulating uh, plate of uh, fiberglass material that I put in between the top of the concrete foundation and the underside of the radial plate. The reason that I insulated it there is that it is not good practice to allow aluminum to go in direct contact with concrete. Concrete, especially when it's wet, has a strong basic reaction which uh, chemically attacks the aluminum and it will etch away the aluminum if it's left into uh, direct con <coughs> contact with the concrete surface. So by putting um, a barrier strip, which is uh, an insulating strip about uh, half an inch thick, between those, uh, it is uh, prevented from eroding away the underside of the radial plate. This column right here <coughs> goes up to and supports the grounded end of the lightning discharge gap. These are the transmission line switches right here for uh, uh, diverting the uh, coaxial line that comes up out of the ground here to uh, whichever one of the matching networks I need to use at the time. <coughs> now here is a detail <coughs> at the uh, lower end of the upper insulator that go up to the tower. I want you to notice the kind of connection from the cable that I use, you notice it's a thing that is wrapped onto the cable like this. Here's the cable itself. You notice it gets a little fatter right here and goes up and around the thimble and is linked over to the clevis of the insulator. <coughs> here is one of those things. It's called a cable end preform. Some of you may already know about these, or some uh, may not. Uh, this picture is a little deceiving. Actually, the thing turned around there as I snapped the picture, and so this is closer to the camera than this. It's really not bigger on one side than the other. It's equal on both sides. I'll show you how those things are put on the cable. <clears throat> In this picture, I have it halfway wrapped on to the cable. The preform is wound around it, and it has the same kind of effect as one of these, what they used to call a Chinese handcuff. You ever see those little woven things? You put your fingers in, you can't pull them out. Uh, it has that same effect. <coughs> and furthermore, on the inside of the turns, it has some aluminum oxide crystals fused onto the metal, which makes terrific friction onto the cable. You might say, how strong is this thing? it will develop the full strength of the cable. It will not break, and I always, uh, <clears throat> just as a matter of safety, I start the cable itself, you can see it visible right here, so that you can visually see that the cable has not slipped in it. I've never known one of those things to slip. They are uh, really elegant to use. They're not all that expensive, I think, for a four-inch cable, they cost $2.40 a piece, 
um, and uh, are so much neater looking than the usual cable clips. And I believe they're more durable, really. They don't tend to rust out like those cable clips sometimes do. <coughs> this is a very bad picture. It's sadly underexposed. I apologize for that, but you can see the uh, detail close up of that winding uh, right in this area. You can see those aluminum oxide crystals, but I'm afraid not in this picture. Anyway, that's the, <coughs> the way that uh, Stuff looks. Now here is the anchor post insulator. This uh, bottom end of it goes to the <coughs> to the anchor post, and I uh, want to show you several uh, typical pieces of hardware. This is the plevis. This is called the plevis at the end of the insulator. It has a plevis pin through it. It was so large that I didn't have all the hardware to leak that one inch pin in particular ones. So I put uh, some big uh, welded rings there and used this device, which is called a shackle. You can get them at the hardware store. They're uh, uh, four pieces galvanized. Here is the uh, turnbuckle. Here again is the preform end grip wound on, and then the cable goes on up. This is called a thimble. By all means, use those. Don't let your cable bear against some bearing surface directly because it can uh, result in eating through the strands of the cable or ultimately weakening the cable. Let's see if my focus seems to good on this. I want to show you something in particular here. That's a better focus. Uh, I want you to uh, pay special attention to this piece of wire that is threaded through the turnbuckle and tied on to the rings, the forged rings at the end of the turnbuckle. That is a safety wire. The purpose of that is to keep the turnbuckle from unwinding itself, and believe me, they will do it. The <coughs> turnbuckle, as you probably know, has a right-handed thread on one end and a left-handed thread on the other, which allows it to draw up the tension. By the same token, when there is tension on the guy cable, there is moment tending to unwind the, the turnbuckle. Uh, and especially in wet weather when water gets into that thread and lubricates it, as any sailor knows, those turnbuckles will unwind themselves and would very neatly drop your tower on the ground. Um, <clears throat> by tying a piece of wire, I use a piece of aluminum wire through here, yeah. called aluminum, uh, just simply linked, linked through the body of the uh, turnbuckle, uh, it, it makes it impossible for the turnbuckle to unwind itself. Yes, sir? I have one suggestion. If you use what the free forms of the guy grips, uh, what we call <coughs> yes. on both ends, I don't know about down here, but I'll tell you in Oklahoma, if you use it at the bottom end, you better put a regular guy wire clamp at the very top of that thing, especially if you've got a large wire, because under icing conditions, you get a lot of radial ice build up, and it's been known when it does break loose, it doesn't always fall off. Sometimes it will slide down, and it will, un it will unwind the, one of those uh, guy grips just as nice as can be. Is that right? I, I hadn't experienced that, well, but it's a good point, and you should listen to this fellow over here, because he's obviously used them. Um, <clears throat> OK, um, anyway, the, um, the turnbuckle should uh, always be locked <clears throat> with a safety wire that way. Many a fellow has found to his dismay that they will unwind themselves. Now this is how I attached the bottom end of the fiberglass insulator to the anchor post. I filled my anchor post with concrete and put a piece of rebar down this inside of it. Uh, it adds to the weight of it. It keeps water from getting down inside. And furthermore, if under some extreme circumstance, the uh, pipe should break. The piece of rebar in the interior of the pipe would still keep the guy into the anchor and uh, presumably would not allow the tower to drop. It would get pretty floppy, but it would not drop the tower. So I didn't take that precaution when I installed the anchor post. Uh, this is an underexposed view of a cable uh, of a uh, uh, cable clamp or cable uh, clip. Uh, 
you all, I'm sure, have seen those things. 